Hello and welcome to this very special episode. I suppose they're all special in their own way. Everything's uh, special and everyone's special. You heard it here, folks. Of Shot by Shot with me, Oliver Luddy. And me, Joe Kelly. And we're here to watch today um, one of Joe's favourite films. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. One that I very much enjoy. The te- well, enjoy is not necessarily the right word I'd use. But... We're doing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And don't you dare ask which one. <laughs> is, there, is there still anyone? I, I have to explain to a lot of people which one I mean. <laughs> really? I'm always like, I, I'm always quite like shyly like, I love the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And they're like, what, really? And I'm like, which one have you watched? <laughs> I suppose e- even saying the original is quite a risque, because it does have that history of controversy behind it. Yes. When you say this is a favourite film of yours. It's such a provocative title, mm, isn't yeah. it? Um, I guess, you know, even when it came out, even though there's not actually anything that graphic or, or sort of extreme we'll about it. it goes. Yeah. It's incredibly artful. But it was, you know, executed. people at the time wanted to kind of censor it, mm. cut it, all kinds well, of stuff. The BBFC like banned it in several areas of the UK altogether, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Surrey, I think Surrey, Sussex, and somewhere else <laughs> didn't get it at all. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, that's my, interesting. My, my J- folks down in Sussex wouldn't have gotten it. <laughs> Poor them, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I was going to say, uh, James Furman, who was secretary of the uh, BBFC at the time, he's throwing quite a lot of bold statements at it. He called mm. it, uh, he said it had the pornography of terror about it, and he also referred to it as psychological terrorism. So, I'm kind of not surprised due to how it is a very full-on film, regardless of the lack of gore. It is, a, like, psychologically, it's a very oh, full-on yeah. film. Um, and I don't really think there was anything else that compared to this back in the time. I think For was... kind of full on, just relentless intensity. No, yeah. I don't think so either. I, mean, I just want to say, you know, those sounds, the camera sounds, yeah, yeah. Uh, that it's become such a classic staple and it's used in pretty much all of the sequels and all of the remakes. Um, it took absolutely ages for anyone to figure out what that sound actually was. And I think on the 40th anniversary commentary, Toby Hooper finally revealed that it was, I think it was a small metal pitchfork hit against a uh, broken right. guitar like and you see yeah. people have made youtube copies of it mm. and uh yeah because they were saying that on one of the documentaries a lot of the sound effects in this were from toys um electronic equipment yeah um, lots of children's Tony toys Hooper was, yeah experimenting a lot with electronic um, music at the time um, can i just say this is such an incredible opening shot well, this is bookended by two incredible shots. And yeah. The ending is one of your favourites as well. Absolutely. But yeah, it's so like, and I love the, the lighting as well. It's already that kind of weird yellowish mm. brown cinematography. Like you can feel the heat immediately. The smoke. Is, or, is that dust, I assume? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think apparently a lot already. of the dust and the smoke is like natural. Yeah. They didn't have yeah. any kind of oh, smoke yeah. machines or anything like that. Such a minimal budget. 700 thousand dollars or it later escalated to 700 000. yeah i think they had to do a lot of marketing and distribution well, costs were big also um yeah well in order to finance this film they sold the rights or, or they sold shares of their production company to a whole slew of different film producers which meant in the end when it actually turned a profit most of those producers ended up receiving money over the original cast so like yeah the cast earlier, received yeah. very little oh yeah they? yeah they were quite cheesed off about that mm. they got so little from, back from this so i guess a massive success it was yeah so, so i guess before we get into the nitty-gritty of stuff <laughs> um i kind of insisted that this was one of the first commentaries we did because uh i love this film what yeah. did you think when you watched it in preparation for this commentary. Cause... Well, do you want to mention your love of it first? Oh, <laughs> I'm too shy. You've got a poem prepared. <laughs> um, <coughs> this was prepared by me. Um, yeah, no, I guess... Written, it says on the top, written by Joe <laughs> Kelly, aged eight. <laughs> Shrewsbury Elementary School. Entitled, Why Do I Love It? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, think, I guess the easiest way to explain why I love this film so much uh, is to explain why I love horror films so much. So... You know, first of all, it's a, clearly a genre of extremities. You know, horror films are designed to push boundaries, explore very surreal ideas. 
And I think for me, what's most exciting is it's showing people, showing characters being pushed to their absolute limits. So you know when you're watching a horror film, like a good horror film, characters are constantly sort of walking a knife edge between life and death. So any film that captures this sense of imminent danger, it kind of grips me without fail. Yeah. It's like yeah. that, that's the one genre where I can just stick one on and yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, and Especially you, groups of people like this. You've always said you have an affinity for films where... Like a, a group of characters, get of very diverse off one at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's a weird. It's which a weird which thing. crosses over to action as well, doesn't it? It's like we always say about like aliens or something like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Where, I think Predators, a yeah. good example as well. Although yeah, it's not really the same thing uh, with this film. Like I think mm. that section of the film is of this film is probably the oh yeah, no, bit. it's not the the most interesting part is actually I would say the 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 villains, so to speak. Um, yeah, the dynamic between yeah. those those villains, how it how it examines those characters, which again, I suppose we'll get to. Is that the truck from the end? Oh no, it's not. No, <laughs> it's not. I love like even this when it's just introducing the characters, nothing's really happening. It's already like mm. it's intercut, and there's all these weird like low angle shots and like weird intercutting, yeah. which immediately disorientates you mm. and makes you feel uncomfortable well it, it's like you're saying it, it highlights the like knife's edge idea of like you know like him tumbling off of the wheelchair how yeah. you know sort of um danger being around every corner when you sort of least expect it it just sort of heightens it as it goes absolutely um, as this whole film is about finding danger in the middle of nowhere where you, where you... Had... sorry I was just gonna say where you wouldn't wouldn't expect to find it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. And also um, something that struck me, I actually only rewatched this earlier today because I only had enough time to watch it earlier today. But um, something that really struck me was as I was watching this, I'd think, "Oh man, the, the performances are what really make this film." And then I'd think, "The cinematography is really what makes this film." And then I was like, "The soundtrack, really." But it's one of those films where every sort of stylistic element really comes together. Oh, it's extraordinary it how it's a film where in pretty much every department you can think of sort of cinematography, mm. editing, sound, the art perform- direction, yeah, as well. the performances. It's just insane creativity because they were mm. working under such difficult circumstances, such low budget. I think mm. the, the whole thing was filmed over about 32 days, I think. Yes, yes. And they were filming seven days a week, yeah. which is crazy. Like well, the, the, the dinner scene took 27 hours, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. That, the, we'll absurd. talk about that, I yeah. think, probably when it comes. Um, I was going to say, um, I mean, one of my favourite films is Mad Max 2, and that's a film that I always love because it shows that, obviously it didn't have as small a budget as this, but it's one of those films that shows that even with a very minimalist style, you can create one of the sort of greatest classic classics of cinema yeah would you say this is the same thing for you that you would look on this film and think this inspires me to create i know you're not as into practical filmmaking as i but... oh but if if there is any film it would probably be this one yeah. i think it just um yeah every creative decision is just so bang on and it's all about suggestion and it's all about using the the, the technical gifts that film gives you to maintain this relentless terror it's it it's so much more sophisticated in the way it's made than I think yeah. people would initially give it credit for. It's only oh, yeah. when you watch it multiple times where you just marvel at the technical skill that goes into it. Mm. Um, well, there was a... Oh, I can't remember which critic said it It was more... Um, sort of... Uh, more of a, cent- a, a, a... A sort of stimulus for the senses than the intellect. I think it's sort of... It's almost like what we were saying about Batman, you know, it's, it's so sort of steeped in style that initially, I think when you watch it, you you think, wow, this is like an overload for my yeah. senses. But then you think about it a bit more and it really has that intellectual sort of um, thread going through it. Well, the thing is, I, I don't know if it was inspired um, by this movement in particular, but I think a few people have compared this to uh, like a movement in theatre called the Theatre of Cruelty. Have you heard of that? No, no. So it's, um, it was kind of originally developed by a man called, I think it was Antonin Artaud. Artaud I might be um, pronouncing it wrong. Mm. But it, he basically f- thought that theatre was a place um, where kind of sound and striking imagery and gestures 
should take precedence over dialogue right. and almost like the theatre should be a space where because it has that tactile quality yeah he wanted yeah. to kind of break the proscenium arch yeah. and form a connection between the audience and uh, the performers yeah. basically and make it like not a like a safe space it was like they were beneath the surface we all have all these kind of primal urges and we just want to scream and shout and yeah, shit and yeah. <laughs> whatever and the theatre is the space to do that and I think this film particularly the final half an hour mm. you could use a lot of the descriptions of that yeah, movement yeah. to describe this yeah. um, so would th this film has been compared to that movement then? Or I think I've read you... a few articles in which yeah. there's the um they make that comparison but right. i think when i first watched this i was learning about it in theater studies at the time and i was like shit this is like yeah, what yeah. i imagine like That's if you reflecting. stuck a camera in a mm. theater of cruelty play that mm. would be like but in especially this here game, where it's like confined within this van i mean yeah this so these scenes were incredibly to... shot yeah because yeah, there's a sound guy and toby hooper oh, just yeah. lying about yeah. in there yeah yeah if you imagine trying to fit a whole camera crew inside <laughs> yeah. this tiny little and the van belonged to um one of the crew members didn't it uh, I can't remember which crew oh, it was. Yeah, I can't remember um, either. Was, was it, it Robert Burns who did the art? No, direction? no, it wasn't no. his. He was off uh, picking roadkill off the road. Yeah, yeah, he was doing <laughs> his taxidermy, um, which is incredible as well. So. Can I just say, so this is the uh, introduction of uh, Edwin Neal's character, the Hitchhiker, and um, I just, I, I just absolutely love. This is the last time I'm going to say I love. <laughs> but each of the family members, except for obviously Leatherface, the big cheese, um, all their introductions. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all their introductions are so kind of understated. Like I love that there's mm. no music. He's just like jumping around well, on the side of the road. Yeah. You and don't consider him it. the central threat at all. No, you think yeah. he's the kind yeah. of guy who now in horror films is like at the gas station going, yeah. you know, well, you won't find any dangerous around the corner. Corner. Yeah. 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 And it's the same with the uh, the cook as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's well, that's even more understated. Mm. Like, oh, absolutely. When he comes in later, the first time I watched it, I was Such like really shocked yeah. when he just suddenly turned out to be crazy. Yeah. Well, I think that moment, uh, we'll, we will talk about what I think is your greatest summary of the film <laughs> uh, later, but that moment really. Ooh, comes I don't even know what you're. Referring oh, to. No, 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 no. oh my god! It's oh, so we're exciting. going after that, folks. It's a weird. They they gave him like a birthmark on his face, didn't they? Yeah. Was it meant to be a birthmark? I yeah, yeah, said that so, in the yeah. Edwin Neal said that. Yeah. yeah, it's such a strange. Role. This moment really, really, I think, is a great, mm. terrifying moment. I love how he just like how understated again. Him just mm. taking the knife is and looking at him. Yeah. There's no music. It all just is drawn out as well. Feels incredibly yeah. natural, and there's no release of tension. Mm. Like I feel like if this was made now, it would be like a. You know, the knife, and then it's crap, yeah, yeah. Boom, hell, wall man, wall man, stop it, stop yeah, it, yeah. you don't have to do this. And in, instead, it's just so, like, ugh, horrible. Mm. Or it'd be really quick, and then he just gets chucked out of the van much quicker. Yeah. Um, what do you think of, like, the sort of the documentary? <laughs> that's probably like half of the blood that we see in the yeah, whole film. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what's so interesting. I don't know, it, people, how recently <laughs> people, you've watched it. <laughs> people, listen up. Um, I don't know how recently people have watched it, but the big, big thing people misconstrue about this film, and I fell for it. I don't know if you did it. Yeah, I'd yeah. probably told you before. No, no, I but, don't think you did. Um, when I first watched this, I was convinced that it was a really gory film. Mm. I was like, I think I remember writing a quick review of it online, being like, there's plenty of gore to go around. <laughs> and then I and then I read somewhere that there wasn't any, and I was like, yeah. what? And then I watched it <laughs> You again. took down your review. <laughs> yeah, I was like, shit, <laughs> that's embarrassing. It. There's there's very yeah. little gore. Well, but what, there's this bit when he gets cut, he cuts himself with the chainsaw later. Yeah, you know, it very small. Cut. There's a few kind of splatters like, yeah, every now and then. But... It's like squibs. But yeah, certainly nothing substantial. Um, and it's all down to... That's why I think the cinematography really comes into play because mm. it's so sort of forceful and stylized that um, it really creates this, this impression of violence when there isn't actually any violence. Yeah. Well, there is violence, but oh, okay. gore. There's no. <laughs> There's not really any violence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, a woman being really. lowered onto a meat hook. Not violent that much. Uh, what do you think of like the sort of documentary shooting style? I think it's great. I mean, I, something else that I noticed when I rewatched this was how at the beginning, you know, they they've got all the photo, the sort of um, 
uh, it's almost like a crime scene, is it? The photos, yeah, the yeah. corpses, and you can hear no- news recordings over the top of it, can't you? Or, yeah. or when the corpses are in the cemetery. And um, I know this film was marketed as a true story when actually it's fictional. Um, sorry, spoilers, folks. This did not <laughs> no! happen. No! <laughs> this did not happen. Um, and Toby Ho- Hooper said that it was kind of as a response to feelings on the government at the time of like the disclosure. Oh, there was of a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conspiracies and sort of how much the public knew versus what the government was allowing them to yeah, know. Yeah, stuff like Watergate yeah. and the oil crisis. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think it plays in really well in, in terms of like blurring the line between fiction and reality. And I think a lot of it, like Last House on the Left, the Wes Craven, mm. Sean S. Cunningham yeah. film that came out two years earlier, yeah. um, I think a lot of it was inspired both by news footage of the Vietnam War, which apparently was just insanely graphic. Like you could see, you know, mm. all it, everything in its gory yeah. detail. Um, and also, Toby Hooper was saying uh, the news reports in Austin, Texas, mm. you could watch the news and you'd see yeah, just people with uh, like car accidents mm. and murders, yeah. just brains splattered about everywhere. You and can, it, yeah, I mean, you can tell as well that the whole crew understood that backstory, or, or not backstory, that because that makes it seem those like influences. Too. Yeah, um, or, or, or specifically the Texas sort of influence, because um, when you listen to them in interviews, and of course when you see them performing in this film, there's a real conviction about. Uh, the way they approach it. They all say it's um, like stepping into another yeah. country, doesn't it? Like, Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they clearly have a great understanding of the place that they were living, because most of these people were from Texas, weren't they? Yeah. It, it was all local cast and crew. Um, and you a lot of them were students. Yeah, yeah. And it works so well for these, especially for the young people in the in the van. Yeah. Um, it gives such a sort of natural uh, vibe. What... What is the mark that he does on the that? That's something that I never really picked up. On. I, yeah, I I never really kind of. <laughs> is that a space it? jockey I he was sort of thing? Wiping yeah. his blood on it for the sake. And then of it, it looks like a genuine sort of mark later. This it? shot's fantastic. The way yeah. he's just kind of like running mm. about, and again, no music. It's mm. just him like on the side of the road, like blowing raspberries, yeah, and it's yeah. so scary because they just let Edward Neal go for yeah. it. Yeah, it feels like reality when you would encounter mm. someone <laughs> intimidating and. That's almost what's scary about yeah. it in reality is that there is no emphasis upon the situation that you're in. It, it's a it's a sign of kind of great maturity in the filmmakers mm. as well. Uh, maybe maturity is the wrong word, but that the, they they allow so much of the horror to manifest from the actors' performances. Mm. I think mm. The Shining is probably another one where they do that. They yeah. they obviously there's all kinds of things going on technically mm. with both mm. films, but they really allow the camera to hold on the performances yeah. Yeah. and let them. They also blindfolded the... Uh, or later on, they blindfolded the actors in this quite a lot, didn't they? Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, for a, a number of the scenes, particularly when... Um, it's Francis, isn't it? The guy in the wheelchair. And, uh, Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. And um, I've only watched this earlier today. Um, <laughs> You're doing very well. And the, the who, who's the final girl? Sally. Sally. <laughs> Name it. Sally! Sally! Yeah, the the scene where they encounter Leatherface, they were apparently didn't know that he was coming. It's genuine shock. Oh when he wow! Appears. So yeah, I mean that's a, a very effective jump scare. Yeah, start. yeah, it is. got me, mm. got me when it first came out. Because yeah, so th- this is obviously the introduction of the cook as well, and his um, another incredibly understated opening. Yeah, yeah. He just seems kind of nice. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's nothing to imply that. I, I think he, you know, he's very much like, oh, you want to stay around for a barbecue, but it's not, you know, well, creepy yeah, in any way. This is the thing. This was back in like the time. Uh, I think uh, another comparison is like the Wicker Man of entering yeah. a strange community in which every it's all these local people who are mm. all a bit weird, but they're like recognizably yeah. weird. Oh yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. in all the kind of Platinum June remakes, <laughs> they're all like they immediately not they get there names. and immediately it's playing creepy music and immediately there's like a shot of the women's mm. bum and, and, it, and then it cuts to the guy staring at the bum and he's like you look nice around yeah. here and it's just like oh we don't need this we don't we... see any more of this guy do we the, the guy washing the van no I was <laughs> thinking about him the last time I so watched it sequel Fred yeah <laughs> see part of the family in the second one have you noticed that the sign on the door just says worms <laughs> <laughs> you think they're playing worms if worms for <laughs> <I'm thinking. laughs> what some of the worms call <laughs> They've got a team with each of the worms named after the family members. 
<laughs> you <laughs> lost one of my worms, you stupid boy. When they're not, when they're not torturing people, they're just playing worms. <laughs> Why didn't you let me win? <laughs> I got the earth strike. I got the earth strike. <laughs> yeah, because even he looks sort of curious, doesn't he? He sort yeah. of moves, shambles around in a strange way. Yeah. There's incredibly, like, I think the. Uh, all the locals and particularly the family is a mm. series of fantastic physical performances. Yeah, yeah. I think particularly when uh, Guna Hansen, who mm. we'll, we'll talk about later, I'm That's sure. That's such a subdued performance and yet it says so much. Yeah. Much more detailed again than I think people give it credit for. Mm. It's like even this bit, it's just very normal conversations. It's like getting to know them, getting to know their situations. Yeah. Yeah, there's all these kind of rapid pans mm. and sort of disorientating intercuts between it. Yeah. Yeah, very unusual angles. Mm. What do you think of Franklin as a character? <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of annoying, isn't he? But yeah. He's in, intent. He, he's a curious one because he's annoying, and yet he's a lot of it. For a lot of it, he's the voice of reason as well, isn't he? Yeah. Well, like, he's the only. Everyone one who... kind of scrambles off later, whereas he's a bit more cautious and yet he's so annoying that you know you don't feel fully committed to his voice which I suppose is again it it almost opens up that sort of realism that there's no one character where you're like oh they're obviously the protagonist of this group no they're all kind of just a group of teenagers Sally certainly doesn't come to the forefront until she's the only one left yeah there's I think Franklin's probably the most noticeable of all of the characters but that's Mm. only because he's annoying everyone so much yeah (laughs) And apparently he was like that on on set. He, oh, he, he stayed really in character, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he he just thought because uh, he. I think the actor Paul Partain, Paul A. Partain, um, he didn't. He he just read the script and was like, I hate this character, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and was like, I need to stay in mm. character in order to keep this believable. Um, I one of the things that I found really interesting watching it again though is um, uh, some of these horror films. I think particularly The Hills of Eyes from the seventies. Uh, there's this idea of like you know the civilized people from the town or the city the going into people. the yeah, decent people going into like the wilderness confronting yeah. really horrible nasty people but then obviously the hills of eyes there's an there's an idea that actually those people might be more civilized yeah. and might have yeah. more kind of or are they they are almost like a result of a mistake that the so-called civilized people have yes made. exactly and yeah. they actually have their own moral code mm. which is perhaps makes more sense yeah um and that got me thinking about the difference between the way these main characters treat franklin obviously mm. as a disabled person and the way they treat the grandfather at the yeah, end yeah. and the family take so much care of the grandfather mm. pay him so much attention like carry him really carefully <laughs> down the stairs and yet these people just like leave franklin yeah, to it it's a really shit. odd yeah, yeah it's a really odd thing I, I don't know if it was deliberate but and you know grand grandpa's treated well and he didn't have anything to say about it you know exactly. <laughs> maybe Franklin wouldn't be whining so much if he's treated him exactly well. exactly <laughs> I mean this film has a very obvious I don't know if we've mentioned that yet the, the the most obvious theme of the film being that sort of progression of American culture in the 70s yes sort of the contrast between like the youth this, well you would call them pro- so called progressive youth culture well they're because, kind of hippies they're yeah that's hippie the thing yeah yeah. yeah um and they're reading know, star signs exactly that's yeah that's like the are. biggest side isn't it that means Not you're a hippie content, if you read star signs um, and um the family who are sort of this antiquated um you know image of like america sort of middle american culture yeah sort of the, the out of the work ego. yeah because they talk about like you know sort of meat industry and how well the hitchhiker was speaking earlier like oh you know when they used to do it with people and it's you know now that machines are doing it you know? yeah he's just saying you know that the gun is bad it yeah gets people out of work yeah um i i definitely the last time i watched it read a lot more kind of vietnam subtext into right. that i know yeah. i knew that that was one of terry hooper's influences mm. but all the idea of like the debate between whether the gun or the axe is better mm. and this idea that the if you make quicker and faster weapons then that's somehow more humane like you know <laughs> we're being more humane by creating yeah. guns and a- atomic bombs rather than what we used to use which yeah. is swords, swords and the axes yeah, and yeah. chainsaws and stuff and it's like <laughs> we used to use chainsaws oh shit the no, they time. didn't 
<laughs> Sorry, ignore me. It's funny that you corrected yourself. I thought you were going to be like, yeah, you know what I mean. Be like, oh shit. They Imagine the that. Romans in the Colosseum, like the best gladiator, but awesome. the guy just runs out with yeah. a chainsaw. Well, Ash would have done that, wouldn't he? <laughs> Well, obviously free, people can it? see that but when I just said that to you I made a, the campus little chainsaw <laughs> the you did uh, you did your Gunnar Hansen impression <laughs> uh, it had did you hear um, how like Toby Hooper one of the stories he says about what inspired him to include the chainsaw uh, remind me I don't know if I he was in a hardware store I can't oh yeah yeah called. he was c- c- Christmas shopping yeah, yeah, yeah he was Christmas shopping and he was like how do I get through these crowds of people <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the chainsaw Toby Hooper does seem genuinely a bit crazy from the story <laughs> he's like he's he's a very kind of like he's quite measured when yeah he, he's, he's very movies. measured and yeah. articulate but the stories about how he made this it seemed... maybe back in the day he was a, a hot-haired filmmaker but it's like there's a range amongst horror uh, directors like Wes Craven genuinely is just like a like a very kind teacher he's yeah. just constantly thinking about the theories of his yeah. film he's a very uh, for me I think he's a very like moral filmmaker um, but yeah t- Toby Hooper was an odd one to pin down because <laughs> he's clearly fucking clever for, yeah. for making this um, and he's very articulate in interviews and yet when he was casting all the actors particularly like Edward Neal he was just like <laughs> Can you be yeah. crazy? Yeah, yeah. And he said to Gunnar Hansen, he's like, are you crazy? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then Gunnar Hansen was like, no. Yeah, he just kept auditioning people and be like, do this, do that. I love the interview with Edwin Neal when he's like, Toby Hooper, cool me. He was like, yeah, you were doing some really interesting stuff <laughs> yeah. in there. Um, uh, you want to make this film or not? <laughs> See, yeah, this stuff with Franklin, when he's like, you know, he's left to just like get into yeah. the house himself. Yeah. I was also going to say that it's, it's nice that they sort of don't use this house as a central setting. You come, you know, they arrive here and you imagine, oh, this is where they're all going to yeah, die. Creepy house. house. Yeah, creepy house. But um, it isn't that way at all. Like, they all just leave it in about 15 minutes, don't they? Yeah. It's <laughs> 15, not... 20 minutes. I suppose you could say something else about the fact that they come to Grandpa's house and it's just a derelict abandoned thing they're like oh we'll move on from this yeah there's some subtext in there about (laughs) you know the evolution yeah I've never thought about that really um I think when I was when I was watching this last time I was thinking obviously like the dialogue is hardly sort of Shakespearean but there is definitely even to these early scenes which is usually the shit where you're like skip it get to the horror I don't care about these people um and there's certainly speaking speaking of Shakespearean (laughs) (laughs) Got some uh, passages coming from. I'm more here. fun. I won't be able to take it. <laughs> but there, there's definitely an authenticity to the way they interact. Like oh, there's, yeah, yeah. there's an yeah. ele- there's a feeling that it's they heavily spent improvised time in together. Yeah. yeah. And, sort of formed a and the cast se- sounded like they got along really mm. well. I think maybe mm. there was a bit of a I think there was, was a lot brothers of... in arms sort of thing going on. Yes. Yeah. It was such a painful shoot. Yeah, they, they bloody suffered for this. Mm. Particularly Marilyn Burns. She sounds like oh, a yeah. fucking badass. Yeah, like, she sounds it, like a trooper. I mean, it's a lot... The shit she went through mm. would be like... Particularly by the end. It, it would be like called out as like crazy yeah. now. Like, there'd be like criminal charges, I reckon. Did you, did you hear she reshot the end after they had wrapped? So basically they shot... I, I think the ending was their final uh, scene or final thing to shoot oh yeah it was and um, and they were like oh it's wrapped that's, that's everything done and she was like oh thank thank god yeah and then she received a call a, a little while later where they're like I'm sorry Marilyn but you're gonna have to come back <laughs> no and yeah and apparently like the laughter the like hysterical laughter of her in the pickup truck is like half real yeah <laughs> she's just like I'm so done with that's this. amazing I've got to say I think her performance in this is mm. incredible yeah. in terms of like maybe it was the fact that everyone was going insane on yeah, the shoot but just her, hysteria I yeah. can't I can't think of a, like very few horror performences where someone goes for it quite so much and mm. has so much like energy Genuine to maintain fear. in their yeah, performance yeah. I think another one that's really good is the the woman in possession. I can't remember her name, but that, oh yeah, for yeah. sheer commitment, mm. those I think yeah. are two of the best horror mm. performances out there. Outshines Sam Neill in every way. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I love also that you can like see the heat waves all oh, the yeah. way through. Mm. It really seems sort of scorched. Like you say, I I imagine some of it is down to color timing, but it has that sort of orange, you know, washed out look to it. 
I'd be interested to see a HD. We're watching this on DVD. I'd be interested to see because it's not film because it's still kind of like an indie sort of budget title, and yet it's you know in the. I'm pretty sure it's in the National Film Registry because it is so sort of historically significant. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see what sort of treatment it's had on Blu-ray. Um, if it is there like is a, there a Blu-ray release of it? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was at, least, say, I'd at be least one. If it wasn't. Um, I'd imagine a boutique label has probably give it given it a, a good um, good treatment. And then, and also it, it, it's incredibly incredible how understated the first shot of the house is. It's mm, just that mm, that zoom in like, on the top of it. Yeah, on the horizon. And look, it, it yeah. looks uh, doesn't Happy, look obviously pleasant. scary. <laughs> There's yeah. yellow flowers. It, it seems really nice. Blue skies and clouds. <laughs> Max, <laughs> what was his name? <laughs> Max what? What's Christopher Walken called in Bound? Oh, Max Shrek. Ma- yeah, Max Shrek. So yeah, Max Shrek. That that you sounded like him. <laughs> really? Doing a commentary of the film. <laughs> Blue skies, clouds. It's a house. It's not obviously <laughs> scary. Leatherface. If you have an eye older. <laughs> the Leatherface. Afraid not. I'm just a poor schmo who got lucky in the middle of Texas. And uh, again, I'm going to talk about this a lot. There's a lot of horror tropes which are now incredibly overplayed, which are so (laughs) subtle in this film. Like, he looks under the net, sees a bunch of cars. It's just like, oh, they collect cars. And then I know, it's such a lovely, like, touch, isn't it? You read into the fact that they're killing loads of people later on. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like, those cars don't come into play later. It just embellishes the... Yeah. The sort of lives of the uh, of the family. It, in, it enriches the situation. Mm, yeah. It's just sort of yeah, and and I mean we're coming up to it soon, but the first appearance of Leatherface is so sudden as well. It's 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 funny because the film has really taken its time up until this point, and yet once they get in the house, it's actually quite quick when he suddenly oh, it's, appears. It's an incredibly it's short film, so, and it yeah. escalates very mm. very quickly. How much did the, um, I guess it's, this is the time to ask more general questions. <laughs> how, how much did this scare you when you were, when you first watched it? Both times I watched it, it scares me quite a lot. It's, it's, I mean, well, shall I, <laughs> shall I go into like, uh, you basically, Joe always sums up this film as being like a nightmare. And that is something that I would absolutely agree with because it has the same, once it really gets, well, even from the beginning, where there's this sort of plot meandering about and then suddenly something goes wrong and then it gets really stuck into sort of fear and terror and it doesn't relent either, Um, not even for pacing's sake. You know, she's being chased around by Leatherface for quite a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, A long portion of the film is is an extended chase. I wouldn't call this film enjoyable and yet I wouldn't say it's, you know, bad because it's, you know, it's so artfully done. It does remind me of like a, a nightmare that I would have where I'm being chased by something and there isn't that feeling of escape um, it just doesn't let up yeah and I, I think it, I, I think also what's terrifying about it is that there's just no logic and there's mm. no explanation mm. I can't well, exactly. the, the remakes fucking trying to explain <laughs> Leatherface's backstory it's like Get in the sea. I don't want to hear it. Like it's <laughs> well, this just... film again. This film does it enough by just the art design. Yeah, it does, and it, it it does it how it should be mm. done, which is it gives you clues, and it's all in the performance, and yeah. it's all in the subtlety, and then that allows the audience to bring their own interpretation. Yes, yeah. it's not like oh, Leatherface is now a goodie. Did they do that? T- I'm sure Chainsaw they did. Three D, the fucking harbinger of shit. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that we we yeah. This is the big guy. Here he is. Oh, glory. Is he Don't go in the that, house. He's gonna fill that door frame. Don't go in the house. Was this this was a video nasty, wasn't it? No, it's it's oh, right. not on the listed thing. Because oh, because it, it it didn't get released on VHS in the first place, did it? Oh. It's the squealing he makes as well. I think that was the only sound. Oh, and the convulsing. Yeah. It's so oh, and the way he just chucks his body. To it really side. does feel yeah. kind of real. It's such a weight to it, and it's amazing how the music mm. only comes in after he's killed. Yeah, and he slams the door shut. Mm. That low it's humming noise. Body. Yeah. Is that, um, I just thought was that a visual? Is that something that the Evil Dead referenced? With the 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 like swinging bench. You know, that's on the porch in the Evil Dead. 
Oh yeah. I don't know. Is that, is that me picking up on so that? So many movie? filmmakers were inspired yeah. by this. Yeah. I mean, Ridley Scott was inspired yeah. by this for Alien. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says it's his main inspiration, which mm. I found odd. They're such different films. But... I think you've got the sort of female, the, the unexpected female lead. Yeah, I guess story wise, I think just it, it, in a, in a the way that their films are made are very different. It's like I don't know, a, a, if you imagine compare this, them exploring the house to exploring the spaceship and Alien. Something, yeah, something I, I guess again, out. it's like I, I don't. It's like the broad stroke. This doesn't summarize yeah. this section of the film. Doesn't summarize what I always think of. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I just think, yeah, it's it's some of the broad strokes that there. Fun fact here: the swinging birdcage, because uh, I think one of the, it was one of the sound designers or the editors worked on the Exorcist as well. Um, basically, somehow the noise of the swinging birdcage, I think you can hear now. Is Reagan's bed shaking in The Exorcist? <laughs> yeah, it's the same noise. Yeah. And also the pig noises, I think, um, were done by Wayne Bell's dad, who did the sound <laughs> to it. Really? He, yeah, he did the impressions and he recorded them. Yeah, Gunnar Hansen did all of the other noises for Leatherface. Oh, he does. He does all Leatherface's yeah noises yeah, himself. Other than I the, think it's like the pig than noises. Pig noises yeah. yeah. I hate all of. Uh, is it all f- just feathers on the floor here? Gross. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's something well. that the, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how much the Blu-ray would change this, but that sort of dark lack of clarity where she lands on the floor and you can't quite see if it's like dust or feathers. Yeah. It's just gross. It's one of those ones where I it really justified why mm. she stays on the floor so long because yeah. she's you just know first shocked. of all it's so overwhelming and there's so much shit everywhere. You'd be like, how do I like, how do I even get up? How do I even begin to mm. deal with this? Robert Burns did such a great job on the set uh, decoration in this. Yeah, it's very very creative. Although apparently in the heat, everything just smelled yes, so yeah, yeah, bad. everything started decomposing, didn't it? Uh, and not a lot of this, um, most of it's animal bones, isn't it? They they got one human ske- skeleton for um, close ups. Yeah, but I think again, it tells you so much about the kind of the family and the dynamic in the house mm. that there's such a strange mixture of all this stuff just lying around. And yet some of them is displayed in very kind of elaborate sickeningly ways, yeah. elaborate, mm. artful ways. Mm. And all these tools, you kind of wonder like what, how much pleasure Leatherface kind of it. gets from this. It's mm. bleh, fucked up. Well, it's not even pleasure. From his performance, you I almost think it's like a, a weird fascination, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, I suppose you should mention... Even though this is fictional, it is based upon the real life killer Ed Gein, um, who had who was yeah he was, was one of the Leather inspirations. Fa- Leatherface was probably mostly based upon him. Yeah, um, where he um, he raided uh, graves and killed two women um, and did you know things similar to this, yeah, know, skinning them, all of that sort of thing. Um, yeah, read into it if you want to know more details. <laughs> it's, it's not kind of very nice. Not nice. I can't remember who the other one was. Um, Wayne something. Uh, there was another serial killer as well. Wayne Grow. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the meat hook thing is the. I think the big scene that everyone thinks mm. the meat the hook. hook comes out the other yeah. side, but it doesn't. Again, I think that's the credit to um, her performance, what, uh, Terry McKin- M- Terry McMinn's performance, and just the way the shots are constructed, yeah. which well, sells it. Also, it was very difficult to because she had quite a, a, a minimal outfit on. Get making a harness that wouldn't show for the for hanging her up was very difficult, apparently as well. Yeah, I think she could be held up on there for a maximum of like a minute because all of the weight was on her crotch. Yeah, uh, all of, you know when she's being hung there. Again, they had to come up with just the most bizarre ways of getting these shots. <laughs> yes, yeah. they yeah, literally shoestring budget. I think uh, they used some of the same makeup appliances for the grandpa because eventually they just ran out. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get any more, so they just had to keep using the same makeup. And these are these are all the little decisions and all the details which, for me, makes this film hold up mm. pretty much better than anything because I think a lot of the classic most famous horror films obviously that they're, they're very important and there's that there's pleasures to be had <laughs> yeah, in not them. not to put them down but this is the best no one. <laughs> no but like some of them haven't aged that well at all like oh I, yeah Night of the Living Dead is 
pretty. Really? I, I really don't think it's aged that well. Oh, right. Because um, I hear a lot of people say, I haven't gotten around to watching it yet. But In I've... terms of its influence, it's incredibly important and incredibly, yeah. Yeah. like, thank God it exists because it paved such mm. an exciting way for horror. Re- that inspired this. Mm. But I literally think this is still scary now and it's still yeah. technically yeah. well done now. Well, it takes a timeless approach to fit. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, because that's the thing I I think even though this is very symbolic of the 1960s and 70s I think it still can apply to today I think there still is a divide like this particularly in America oh yeah and and also like even if you take away the the idea of America and this being Mm. like a classic American film um, it I you know I really think this is probably the most pure representation of what makes the horror genre so interesting it's like deals with all the ideas of sort of ideas of what is civilized you know mm. what kind of broils beneath the surface what like what is going on with the people who aren't in like the inner cities mm. and metropolitan mm. areas um yeah just kind of timeless yeah. ideas really well i've had an idea for a film for a while which isn't really horror based but I wanted to get horror from that idea and I think I came up with this before I had seen this but this perfectly encapsulates what I wanted to do where it's like that fear of lawlessness or yeah you know, I mean mine was sort of a more about space and sort of that idea of once you escape civilization you know where the law ends and you yeah. just enter just sort of the void and this perfectly and it's almost scarier because it is still in a recognisable world it's recognisable but not civilised mm. well civilised in its own way perhaps. and I think it's important <laughs> that it's, yeah, like, like, civilised through chaos yeah exactly <laughs> oh that's the thing that, that was weirdly what my uh, I wrote an essay about this ah <laughs> yes. you got there even before me yeah <laughs> um, and um, yeah I think a big uh, thing about what I was writing about is even though everything is so chaotic and anarchic and they're all clearly so mad there is a weird order to their world the fact that you know it ends with them sitting around the table for dinner oh, yeah. Yeah. at a time where probably everyone was starting to eat food in front of the TV and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. There's a weird kind of old-fashioned... Yeah, and impressing the almost, visitors. Almost thing. conservatism mm-hmm. to them yeah. in a weird way, but it's their own fucked-up <laughs> yeah. idea of it. Mm-hmm. I think I absolutely love the lighting in this segment yeah. of the film, like the real like harsh sort of orange lighting. Because mm-hmm. it, it, that's a time of day which can be so beautiful. You can imagine if you were standing yeah. in just one of these fields, it would be absolutely beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. Gives it a hellish quality here. Yeah, definitely. The, like you said, well, I mean, yeah, like you say, it's almost like descending into the nightmare realm at yeah. this point. Like when, like I said, like when Leatherface first appears and it's so sudden, it's almost like when you're having a dream. Yeah. And suddenly something that you thought of the day before or something scary that you thought of at some stage just suddenly appears in your dream and in an instant it turns from a dream to a nightmare exactly yeah um yeah that's a that's a good way of describing it actually mm. De- definitely when Leatherface turns up i have to say i think jerry's death here is um maybe the weakest scene in the film i'd say there's not much set up to it and it doesn't really i think it's just the only thing where you understand why films like this in- inspired so many parodies because mm. there just isn't quite enough like it's it's such a don't go in the house moment, mm-hmm. and I think it's it's amazing how many of those silly kind of horror cliches this film doesn't actually fall into. And I think yeah. this is the one bit where it's like we need to get rid of Jerry. He needs to just <laughs> stand at the door and be extra, like, "Come on, guys, yeah, quit messing about." Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like even the first two kind of make like a bit of sense. He's just like, oh yeah, because you you know the first guy doesn't know there's anything wrong. She mm-hmm. goes in to look for him. Yeah, and I think him, they kind of die as a pair. What's this guy yeah. expecting <laughs> when he sees the meat hook and like? Mm. But yeah, you read about Ed Gein's mannerisms, where he was quite reserved, and apparently he was a model inmate once he was committed. And there's almost some of that in Leatherface as well. Yeah, you, you know, can imagine a, him a being of quite quiet a... sort of quality to him and. It's not so much that he relishes in this, it's more that it's just something he's fascinated with. No. You know, there's like, almost like an art to it that he doesn't sort of revel in. It's just something that, I love this, where he's like, 
Where are all yeah. these people yes, coming from? Yeah, that's, yeah. I think I was going to say, like, <laughs> they uh, mentioned that in Guna the, Hansen yeah. in his uh, interview. It's, it, I like the idea that uh, Leatherface is, you know, he kills the most people and he's the most violent, and yet he's the, he's the scared, most terrified scared, character. Yeah, he's yeah. just like, where are all these people coming mm, from? Such a brilliant character. Well, and it, yeah, like I said earlier, just it's just a, a, such a brilliant physical performance. And I love this long shot that zooms in on him. It always makes me wonder what he's thinking. <laughs> oh. It's like, is that a smile? Like well, He sort of looks down in a kind of bashful way and sort of looks about again. Yeah. And again, that it's, says it's... so much more than <laughs> Texas Chainsaw 3D. He's a good guy now. <laughs> I mean, there's. It, this is a really interesting film because it is so relentlessly scary, and yet there is that undertone of sort of sadness to some of the family, where it's you know, you can you can see the sort of psychological uh, cracks in their sort of personalities and their relationships. Yeah. And how they're sort of, you know, they could easily be normal, you know, normal people. They're they're, they're sort of they're clearly. Th things have happened in their lives that have sort of warped them to this point. There's something significant yeah, about the fact that it, to them. Yeah, but yeah. Also, there's something significant about the fact that they're all men. Yeah. And um, I think Kim Henkel, the writer, said in an, an interview, this is what we imagine the world looked like without that kind of female touch. Yeah, yeah. And, so and you know, what was what were they like when the mother was around or was there ever a mother <laughs> around? It's just... Well, a, she's upstairs, isn't she? We'll well, that's the that. grandmother. <laughs> grandma yeah, because she sat there with the grandfather. <laughs> And also, like that, that's one of the things I think. I don't know if I can fully credit the producers for it because I think I know Toby Hooper was going for a PG thirteen rating, but I really, Which really is bizarre. How would yeah, you get this PG? It is absolutely crazy. It was, that's Toby it was Hooper given an X, and Toby badness. was like, "Oh crikey!" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's really important that this film, like, even when it comes to it's just like Sally tied up in the house. It's never about sex, and it's never. Oh about, yeah, yeah. It's never leery, and no, it's never. No. Um, to do with their like sort of vulgar sexual gratification no. they ju they're just because so many of not these on their types mind. of films yeah. were at the time and I really th yeah and they still are occasionally it can it, well not it sounds bad to say it can work but I think if they if an if effort is made to yeah. ground it in some kind of character choice then or it's given some sort of thematic context so that it's saying something you know meaningful about it whether, yeah. whether it's if it's shown negatively or or otherwise um when it's done for the sake of it I oh just, yeah it drives yeah. me crazy like yeah. uh I, 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 I don't want to talk about it anymore after this but like <laughs> in texas chainsaw 3d i remember that the bit that really was like that that made it officially my worst film of all time i was gonna say that we do men you do keep mentioning it is your least oh, favorite I hate film it so ever. much but th there's basically a moment where like this kind of side character who you didn't know was bad captures the main girl and he's like tying her up and then for like literally no reason whatsoever oh I he think like you showed me this he rips oh, i didn't show you i think i told you oh mate <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't show hoping you. that my imagination isn't this vivid but he just like rips her shirt open so you can see like her bare yeah, chest, her breasts, and there's yeah. there's nothing to do with his character that suggests that would happen. It, it serves no purpose whatsoever. It's not a it's theme just, of the yeah. film. It's, it's just, just there graphic. because Ur isn't yeah. that gross, yeah. and it's like, and that's when it's not even Ur isn't that gross. It's clearly some boyish sense of yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There's there's a there's mm. a there is a genuine sadism to choices like yeah. that, and I and I think good horror films, sophisticated horror films like that, it's not about watching other people suffer and leering at other people's suffering. It's about mm putting yourself in that position yeah. and experiencing the horror for yourself. Mm. So this is basically the last moment of levity before... <laughs> this is when well, not levity, really just uh, quiet. To, uh, yeah, she's <laughs> screaming for the majority. If we were saying Kim Basinger's screaming is bad, Ma sorry, Marilyn... Marilyn Burns. Marilyn Burns, her screaming is hugely effective. I think hers is more justified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna say I um we kind of missed all this stuff, but um I do like their character dynamic between the two of them yeah. when it's just the two of them, and there's a nice final moment where she decides to like push him through the mm, woods, mm, grudgingly. Um, yeah. 
nice performances, I think, between the two of them. This was a real surprise coming up, and there's a big jump scare as well. Yeah. So. And again, it's not it's not done with not like that up. that obnoxious noise, like the. <laughs> <dun. laughs> the Pennywise jump scare. Pennywise. <laughs> Would well, that be? <laughs> Yeah, I find it interesting. Do you have any interest in seeing the sequels? Yes, do I do. You, actually, you've seen the remakes, but not yeah, the sequels, I've seen the remakes. Um, I, I, uh, I've, unfortunately, I saw the remakes first. Actually, no, I think it was fortunate because I, I watched them and I was like, they're okay. And then I watched this mm. and was like, no, this is the real deal. This is the stuff. I remember. I had ah, that. there yeah. it is. Uh, even there, you can't see anything. Yeah, no. It's funny that you know the little splatters of blood you can see. Yeah. Did you? They had them it? in the mouth. They, they were all spat out. Toby Hooper, yeah. the makeup artist, and um, I think it was Wayne Bell, the sound guy, yeah. um, were all just spitting blood at him. Yeah, yeah. It's such a funny story. <laughs> so this, I think, is one of uh, my favourite um, chase sequences in any film because it's like you said earlier, captures a nightmare. Um, what well, you said even earlier. That's where I got it we wrong. all say. <laughs> This film captures a nightmare. It captures a nightmare um, and puts it on screen. Oh, there's so much to talk about with this bit. Because also, this was um, filmed in an area called like Rattlesnake Hill, I think. Mm. And um, it's about 50 feet of woodland. Right. Um, I think Toby Hooper said in an interview. And the, the way they make it seem... Such a shallow depth of field to it. Yeah, so, but they make it seem so long and extensive just by mm. changing the shot, changing the, um, sort of the, the lens size, changing the angle... And they make it seem like it goes on forever. To bring in my usual Disney comparison, <laughs> it reminds me of the scene in Snow White when she's going through. Have you seen? You've seen Snow yeah, White. Yeah, yeah, that's when a good comparison. Yeah. yeah, it's got that same descent into madness feel to it. Because we all know that you know Snow White is one of the maddest, scariest films of all time. That film does creep me out. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, the it's image, of the, the image early... of the old woman appearing at the window yeah. is creepy. Ooh, the transformation as well. Yeah, I but, don't think um, it's as scary as this. But I think or it... Pinocchio. <laughs> oh no, Pinocchio. Pinocchio is even scarier than this. Yeah, <laughs> Pinocchio is. <laughs> but yeah, Marilyn Burns is such a trooper. This must have really hurt and been like so uncomfortable. She's going through fawns and everything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. I'm pretty sure most of the injuries injuries she gets in this film she actually got. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, when they um, feed the grandpa later. They, she actually they cut, cut her, her hand. Yeah. It's crazy. They, they run, had they run out of blood by that point? Yeah. But I wouldn't be certain. Like, they keep <laughs> all these stories. Of of, well, no, they keep running out of everything. Makeup, appliances, blood. I'm surprised they had enough film left to do the reshoot of her at the end. Yeah, so I, I, I think this is the main reason it captures a nightmare for me. I love that because you like, get this weird door, little yeah. uh, skip he does there. Mm. He, no matter how big and lumbering and clumsy he is, he's always right behind yeah. her. It's like a momentum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's just unstoppable, mm. even though he's so human. It's mm. such a terrifying combination. Look what he's going to do to the door. <laughs> do you ever... Do you, do you, I don't know if you had this when uh, when I was a kid I was so scared of having a nightmare that in the middle of the night if I was awake I would just be on high alert so like if I wanted to go to the toilet I would sort of almost glide across the whole way to the toilet in the, in the darkness and there's this weird autopilot half consciousness feeling to it and there's something about this chase that kind of reminds me of that a bit oh, really? just like pelting through it doesn't you know I mean it stopped here for a moment but then she's off again and it's just like constantly Still, swerving yeah. through this house and then out into the woods again and swerving around outside. And it's, weirdly, it reminds me of yeah, it's that feeling I had. Well, it's it. definitely that idea of like sort of... Yeah. It, it's simultaneously like a, like a limited time and space. Mm. Sorry, limitless time and space yeah. and also feeling very, very confined yeah. as well. It's very like... It's almost like it's on a set path and yet there's no sense of like where it's going to go next. Yeah. Does that make sense? And I think her performance is a big part of capturing that because, uh, you know, she's she's constantly screaming, doesn't do any good, constantly running, doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, my most vivid memory of a nightmare is, like, uh, being in a car with my mum and then she got out of the car and then I couldn't, like, move to take my seatbelt off and then this horrible guy got into the car instead oh, and was just talking to me and I was, like, trying to scream. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, I can't. 
trying to take my seatbelt off, but you're just kind of frozen there. And that mm. to me is what a nightmare is. And I, I can't think, I can't think of a film that captures that as viscerally as this film does. Mm. Mm. It's extraordinary. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's the best film. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> What do you have to say about the three ma- masks of uh, <laughs> Gunnar Hansen? Oh, well, thing. it was interesting to hear it's, that... You know, I didn't notice that, that on the first time. Each one represents yeah. almost like a different facet. You can, you can see that he changes performance style under the different masks. Yes. Because this one... I think this is the same mask that he's had for the whole film so far. And then there's like an old woman one that he has during the like some of the dinner scene. Oh yeah, he's got almost like the the. Uh, like, isn't it grey hair? Yeah, as well? he's like, got grey hair. He's, got makeup he's dressed on, as almost. Like and a... there was a cut scene where he's putting on the makeup. Yeah, well, it's different. It's different masks at the dinner table to the one where they bring her back to the house. They bring her back to the house, and he's like the grandmother, and then it's like oh, a, right. a made like a... up. Yeah, so yeah. almost like a doll's face. The right. last one, and that's the one that he applies mm, makeup yeah. to in the deleted scene. But yeah, this shot here, yeah. like the, the way they mess with time and space and yeah. the fact that he's really right behind her. And yet it's like, mm. look at him. How could he be? <laughs> yeah. Well, this reminds me of like when you think you, that you've woken up from a nightmare and then it turns out that you're still <laughs> having the nightmare. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, it's okay. It's fine. And then, yeah. Also done so in all American Werewolf in London. Yeah. <laughs> I, actually, weirdly, I thought yeah. of that earlier. Holy shit. <laughs> That's, that made me jump a fucking mile when I first saw that. Oh, an American incredible world. scene. That's another film we'll, we'll have to Yeah, we'll about. do that very soon, I imagine. See, um, this, this is odd because we've been quoting John Cena's <laughs> character here uh, for the, the whole evening in a, in a banterous way. Um, when I first watched this, this was, for me, the scariest section of the film. What, um, him sort of coercing It her. was just so... I, I don't know how to. St- I, I think it's specifically when he has her in the car, though, and mm-hmm. the stuff he's doing, the broom. Yeah. Because it's so kind of small. And well, yeah. whatever sense of agency she had has gone. Like even when you know, once she was sprinting, there was at least that feeling that she keeps sprinting. Yeah. And then yeah. once he's just completely trapped, there's something really threatening about it. And my God, do they did both of them sell it in this scene? Mm-hmm. It's like really, really creepy dynamic mm. <laughs> you can kind of tell that the hysterics are slightly real one yeah like I said she, she, she must have just been fucking exhausted mm. what do you think of this shot of the me you can't really tell what it is can you is I mean, it you can people kind of, yeah mm. it's like a silhouette like is that meant to be a torso it's, it's, it's funny isn't it I I I always assume it is sort of human parts, and I assume that's the intention, but it's not blatantly clear. Again, yeah, it's not like like, again in another film, it would it would yeah, it would be like an arm, yeah, 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 like a head, be like her friend's face, like ah. Again, it ties into the what you imagine sort of idea, isn't it? Like how you imagine there to be more gore in this film. And I hate that he reveals kind of who he really is just with the creepy smile. Oh. he's got that, that sort of gappy smile and they use that to great effect in the dinner scene as well don't they where they're just like cutaways to him just sort of yeah. sitting there grinning to himself and again he's the like sweetest guy in real life if you watch all the interviews oh yeah he, he really struggled to film this scene yeah. because it's so you know it, it's her. so unpleasant yeah oh no you just grow up right now yeah. there'll be none of that yeah, and then the noise he makes when he starts hitting her with the broom. Mm. See, th- th- this is what I mean. This is I arguably the most disturbing scene in the film because it mm. feels like there is a sense of it actually happening. Yeah, it's and... so shot so close. And it feels like, like... like a, I mean, it is borderline exploitation style, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's why you know that's obviously why it got such a reaction when it came out. It feels the most kind of grounded and the most. Mm. Um, <sighs> I don't know, the most recognisable form of violence, I'd yeah. say, in the film. Just using kind of household objects mm. in kind of just horrible and disgusting ways. Mm. 
so would you still say that that sequence is your your least favourite, perhaps your most frightening? Uh, yeah, I'd probably. Yeah. Well, I'd say the one coming up where he's driving her. I think this kind of yeah. I mean, this it's funny that you were saying earlier how you couldn't scream, and you know, obviously that's a common thing in a lot of people's nightmares. I have the same thing, and now she's got the rag in her mouth, and it's like always tied into that yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. It's in one big nightmare. They literally, I, I, by the end, they kind of capitalise on every form of fear. Mm. <laughs> it's it's incredibly primal. But it's almost a shame that if you consider those remakes, clearly someone has watched this, at least one person has watched this and taken it from sort of face value sort of thing. Oh, yeah. It's almost like what I was talking about with George Carlin the other day, where I was saying, like, you can kind of take some of his comedy as, like, you know, old man sort of <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, jeery sort of humour and then there are people in the audience who genuinely find it like empowering to hear this guy bitch about like, you know, women's rights. Exactly. And, like, and stuff yeah. like that. It's it's there there's so much misunderstanding mm. of what makes uh these films work and like you said with George Carlin, what makes his humour funny, like yeah. the, the actual irony in it. But yeah, the, you you watch the Platinum Doom remake of this, which I, I don't think is the worst film ever. Um, but it's Ooh. like, <laughs> oh wait, so yeah, it's Tex Texas Chainsaw yeah, there's the 3D. One that was, is... The one by Michael Bay's company Batman, yeah. is actually not as bad. Um, oh, but they clearly were like, okay, the most interesting thing was five sexy teenagers, and then there's a guy with a chainsaw, and he kills them all with a chainsaw, mm. and that's what's fun about it. Uh, yeah, this bit where he's just poking her with a broom, yeah. and you hear her noises. It's um... and you can't see where it's driving either. It's just. In this, you're once again like in this claustrophobic <laughs> yeah. void in the middle of the I nowhere. think what scares me a lot in films is um, like just a crazy disparity in power mm -hmm. and when the person in power will do Abuses anything it. it's yeah. why I find yeah. the stuck in the middle review scene in Reservoir Dogs so terrifying I find mm -hmm. the disparity in power between him and the cop mm -hmm. just so disturbing yeah. and yeah. the idea of being at the mercy of someone oh, like that. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, um, it's also the the scene in the Dark Knight where the Joker has the Batman impersonator. Mm, yeah, yeah. Th those scenes where, um, and this is a prime where they example they don't have that. the morality to, to hold back. Yeah, to do whatever they like. And you just think, imagine being in the other person's mm. shoes. Imagine being at the mercy of those people. And I think that's what effective horror is when you put yourself in the position mm. of that yeah, person. Yeah, when there's that identification. Yeah. And there's a lot of fear in this to identify with. I think there's. It's all to do with the way it's shot and the way. I don't know. Again, we're going down to oh, it's the way it's shot. No, actually, it's the way the performances. So actually, it's the art design. Oh, <laughs> you know, no, it's, yeah. it's everything. It, it really together. is. You idiot. <laughs> Does he call him an idiot? I can't remember. He must do. Calls him like a. a we don't have subtitles, so we can't comment on the dialogue. I mean, he's been the only calm character until now. Yeah. Right? And in the rest of the film, he's just shouting. Mm, yeah. You idiots! <laughs> Again, that the. I the, told uh, you to stay away from that cemetery. Real smoke, mm. not not put on. It's such a wonderful shot as well. Do you see the interview with Edward Neal when he when he was talking about being hit on, on the head, and, and he kept going to Toby Hooper and being like, um, I'm, "Oh yeah, yeah, the, the, like, like fake." I'm feeling yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. Like I, I I think this. Oh, can't be a rubber <laughs> one. Won't uh, look real enough. Yeah, he's like. <laughs> The thing he's hitting me with is really hurting, yeah, and you yeah. know John Cedo feels bad about it. But mm. like, uh, c can we do a rubber one? <laughs> and yeah. yeah, no, 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 we're not doing a rubber one. One look real. Okay. So that is really sort of weird. And... <laughs> Am I waking up or not? <laughs> he's quite funny. I mean, just seesaws between. You know who he visually he reminded me of when I first watched this? James Franco. Yeah, I can see Do that. See a that? Bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got that sort of long face to him, hasn't he? Yeah. Quite long face. Why the long face, James Franco? Edward Neal. Here comes the classic line. Well, I, I've heard also sort of parallels between this film and like meat consumption and sort of like underlying theme of meat in this. And through these sequences in particular, she really is treated like. An animal. And it's yeah. really frightening in that regard. You know, like, like when, I mean, there are shots earlier in the film of just cattle in, herded in little pens, and in this it feels like you know they're sort of herding this animal trying it into the room. Yeah, the absolutely. 
Like, you know, like, you think... Apparently like, Gu Gu yeah. Guillermo del Toro watched this and became a vegetarian for a while. After oh, this. really? Like, yeah. <laughs> not surprised at all. You see, like, a human being treated this way. I mean, this was the point where uh, I got this is quite a good time to explain. Like uh, when I first watched this, mm. so it was like it was. I like hear you almost feel sorry for him. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Absolutely. He's definitely he's, he's definitely the victim yeah, of the family, yeah. and he's completely again at the mercy of his older brother and his dad. <laughs> even, even the dad sort of like goes between wanting to be. Well, isn't it this bit where he sort of asks him where the kids are and he shows him. And then he just like goes quiet for a moment, and then he's just like, "Look what you did!" And just yeah. find something else to abuse there's, him. There's for. no, there's no humanity he mm. can fit in for him. Sorry, what you can say? I'm just gonna say, like, it, um, I, I remember very distinctly watching this section of the film for the first time because mm. I, I was in one evening. I'd watched the remakes, and um, I was like, "Oh, the, the originals online." I've, I'm, I probably won't find it scary because it's a, an older <laughs> film. An old. Yeah, I genuinely was. I yeah. genuinely was. And when I was watching that, I was like, "Oh wow, this is really well made and really mm. well acted." And, and and oh my god! Oh, my, and then it got to the got to this point. I was like, "This is it's so horrid," horrid. Yeah, and yeah. but in a kind of good way. Because also the the style of shooting changes a bit once it enters this part. You know, there's a few more wider angles to show multiple characters at the same time. It really slows down. Yeah. And show really displays the situation for you in a way that hasn't absolutely hasn't done for a while. Well, yeah, there's 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 quite um, a, a wide range of different shots mm. in in, um, in mean, especially yeah, in the dinner scene. Yeah. A mixture between wide angles and like this, extreme yeah. close ups. Mm. It's almost like that that whole chase has sort of been a transition between one world and the next. Yeah. But it's just incredible. I mean, Robert Burns was explaining how he would just get more animal bones and make something else. You know, just the crew would want something else, so they design something <laughs> else, and you, you end up with this house filled with um, all these decorations, a lot of which probably don't get seen in the film. But it adds such a richness to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Such a, such a... What's extraordinary as well is that um, there was a family living in this house yeah, when they yeah. filmed it. Well, the house is still available, isn't it? It's it's now a restaurant. Yeah, I think it's I... been relocated. Yes, um, but it's it's currently operating. You can still restaurant. find the gas station there. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a gas station. Oh, yeah. Yeah, imagine, imagine being that family though, and like renting out your house, and then they'll be like, "You go see the film," and that. <laughs> Our house isn't this dirty, <laughs> honestly. Do you know if this segment of the film was included in the whole, like, um, like 32, no, was it 27 hour single shoot or was that just the dinner scene? Uh, I think it must have been, oh, I can't remember. I, I know that the reason why the dinner shoot was so long was because the guy playing the granddad um, was needed for something else the next day, I think. No, no, sorry. I think it was the cook. One of the two of them was needed. His, oh, no, their the contract. Cook, the cook the couldn't be paid anymore. Oh, right, because his contract um, was ending. Yeah, John Cedo's yeah, yeah. contract was ending, so they couldn't pay him anymore. Um, so they had to get it all done. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming this was all part of the same... I certainly know that, obviously, for continuity purposes, they kept the same clothing. And oh, they yeah. didn't have any duplicates, and they didn't want to, like ruin the clothing by washing it or whatever because yeah they period. wanted to keep the colour in good yeah. hands and shirts so, so he was wearing the same uh, for costume for all of the 36 or 37 weeks yeah. that they filming I felt really bad for him because he um, he was saying that like no one would want to sit next to him yeah, and yeah. and stuff oh, this is such a weird I remember this being one of the weird bits when I first watched oh yeah and, and they were describing when comes to life when the guy playing the grandfather was asked how to play he was asking how to play it they wanted like an embryonic quality yeah, and yeah. that's why when he's sucking her finger he's doing this weird like babyish mm, movement mm. frailing his arms he was out. only 18 at the time 18 yeah wow yeah because i saw in interviews that he was definitely like the youngest the youngest yeah so this is the start of <laughs> here it is the iconic a terrific scene there are no words it will never be but we'll try our best i think she can this is five seconds of silence and mm. then this, is the thing. this was at the peak of summer in Texas, with black the scene surrounded by black curtains because they didn't want the sunlight to come through. 
the whole room was just cooking under studio lights. Yeah, didn't they? They had to keep like everything, replacing the yeah, sausages everything and kept molding. decomposing yeah. and going mouldy. Pretty sure that that chicken ornament just started to fall apart after a time because it was just rotting. And this is hysterical as well. Yeah. It's just screaming a lot. There's, there's, I think this is such an amazing use of sort of POV shots as well, mm, particularly yeah. like l- later on. And this is what I'm, we were talking about, about making sure you like identify with her mm. and that you kind of place yourself in her position. Mm. I guess because of what like Gunnar Hansen's doing at the moment, can we talk a bit more like, about his performance? And it's like... The he he where where was it he went he went to like a school like a school for sort of mentally disabled uh, children wasn't it and yeah and he walk, walked walk around people. for a couple of days yeah. apparently the staff couldn't tell if he was like a visitor yeah. or if he was which yeah. is I suppose is testament to his performance it's so strange the curiosity that he's like mm. looking at her with that sort of gentleness to his movements yeah especially when he starts like. I think it was actually earlier when they bring in the granddad and he's like patting him, and yeah, sort of like stroking him. Yeah, and like he's, he's, check, he's checking him. his granddad's okay. And look at the way he's playing with yeah. her hair as well. Also, did you know um, he was offered to play um, Leatherface again in f- the three initial sequels? So, Texas Chainsaw Part 2, Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3. I can't remember. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not a horror geek. Sorry, guys. Um, Texas Chainsaw, Chainsaw Harder. Chainsaw, Chainsaw 2, um, Chainsauria. <laughs> um, and the, re- the, the Next re- Generation or yes. Return. The first three sequels <laughs> to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, each time, each director um, really wanted to get him back. But it, they, they, he was never offered enough pay by the respective studios. So I think Canon did the first two. Um, sequels and canon were known for being a real cost cutting um, Hollywood studio well quotation mark Hollywood studio yeah they were the ones who came up with Superman 4 if that gives you any context for their <laughs> level of quality is that um, Quest for Peace or yeah yeah um, and then I think New Line did the uh, the fourth film but they weren't sinking that much money into it but each time he was approached for it and he was never offered enough money in fact for the second one he was offered to work for scale plus 10% of whatever profits there were. Um, and then he asked about it and they were like, oh, the 10% is for your agent. And then he said, can you reconsider, you know, come up with a better offer. And then they came back to him with just scale with no 10% because he didn't have an agent. Oh my <laughs> so he got offered less the second time. So yeah, he had to turn it down all three times. Yeah, I felt quite, it, it was quite sad, the interview with him, mm. where he was saying that, you know, he he will, he was like, I'll always be remembered for Leatherface. And he was like, I'm glad I did it, but that will always kind of live with me. And I feel like people will always think that's the most important thing mm. I've done. And he's like, and I don't see it that way. He's like, I, yeah. I don't even think that's the most important acting role I've done. Mm. Um, well, he does a lot of the industrial filmmaking now, doesn't he? Well, he, mm. he's dead now. Oh, of course, he had yeah. passed away, didn't he? Yeah, oh. 2015. Mm. Um again very mild mannered as well oh yeah he, he comes across as very intelligent and, mm. and very sort of just gentle and articulate mm. uh, apparently him Marilyn Burns and Edwin Neal kind of remained friends over right. a year uh, I read a, an interview with her because Marilyn Burns has passed away as well oh right um, and there was an interview I think it, I think it was done in the last decade where she was saying how her and Gunnar Hansen were in London just kind of like <laughs> Oh, that's walking about. Really so yeah, the cast really, it was a positive, it seemed like a positive experience for them, particularly yeah. in hindsight. Yeah. I like the way we're making all this positive chatter whilst we're getting all these extreme quotes. We're <laughs> <laughs> in the most intense scene in the film. Even a film like this, though, there should be some... <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a hope to it. There sh- it shouldn't be the, the way <laughs> it's where it's like, nihilistic. they all needed to like torture and be yeah, horrible yeah. to each other in order to make it, you know, in, in the end. It's... It was gruelling, but... There was a, like I said, there were the brothers in arms. Sort of yeah, thing. well, between the actors, certainly. Mm. Let's see. And yeah, again, Gunnar Hansen patting the granddad on the mm. shoulder. Sort of showing him how to use the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like like an element of politeness. Like when you're a kid, you're always told to like respect your elders yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and it's like the kind of, a real The affection. kind of um, morals that I imagine mm. he takes like very seriously. Mm. That's the thing, in, the, in these scenes you start to see the moral compass of the whole family. You know, their their way of living, there's a weird order to it, even if 
to us it seems completely uncivilized. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, this whole segment where he's trying to like hammer hammer her head is just. I, I was just you get that thought when you're watching it for the first time. You're like, when the hell is this gonna yeah, stop? Yeah, exactly. When is this gonna let up? Mm. Was this was this a rubber hammer? Or was a, I'm assuming it was real from the rest of that. <laughs> Pretty sure they couldn't have afford a rubber one. They just bought a real one. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you kill her, that's um, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And, uh, yeah, Marilyn, are you okay being hit on the head? Okay, nice. Cranial surgery isn't in the budget, Marilyn. <laughs> It's also really weird thinking, again, it leaves it, it to the imagination why the granddad is like that. Is he just that old? Yeah. <laughs> You're like decomposing. Because the makeup's in yeah. very extreme. It's not show. Luckily, they don't show it in enough light to show the scenes. It just, it's sort of in shadow. You can't really tell, you know, where it ends. This section now where she's... Um... She jumps out the window. That was a stunt she actually did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Wasn't she? Didn't she? She was like, "Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I can jump through the window." That shots her. Yeah, uh, and they, th she jumped from some scaffolding. I yeah. love that pan, by the way. So th that's almost like the shot of like someone waking up from a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. When she jumps out, it's daytime that. again. Yeah, as well, yeah. Um, it suddenly snaps. But yeah, the, she jumped from some scaffolding and they threw some sugar glass down on mm. her. But of course, because of the heat, that had got really hard, so that mm. hurt her head. So yeah. more, more pain for Marilyn. Well, also she hurt her ankle, didn't she? Which is why she's limping at this. Point. Yes, yeah. And well, uh, also, of course, you will remember. And this. again, that's a rare sort of wide shot as mm. well. Um, yeah, we start to see a bit more space after the. He's he's had a change in wardrobe. Oh wait, no, no, no. He had it though when he was giving the granddad the hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, again, I think this was largely improvised by Edward Neal. Like he was, he was told to grab her, or in the script it said grab her, and instead he decided to just like playfully like stab at her, and it's yeah. so just. Oh. I think all this blood had just hardened on her by the end as well. <laughs> Pretty effective. Dated effect at all. Uh, cool. This is just one of the most extraordinary endings <laughs> to a film. But what about this guy? He runs off and we never see him again. <laughs> He's the next what one. What about his story? <laughs> Doesn't he come back for the sequel? We've got the car wash guy, we've got the black guy. Who else is returning? <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the thing, it's interesting to like. The first three sequels all seem to take like vastly different approaches to it. I mean, the fourth one was meant to be almost like a remake. Yeah. But apparently, there's there's some sort of self reflectiveness in it as well because obviously it was directed by Kim. What's his name? Uh, Kim Hankel. Hankel. Yeah. Um, that almost went through his leg. Yeah, it went up in the air, didn't yeah. it? Um. And there's a weird element of like self parody to the fourth one. Yeah. And then other people say it's just a remake where I it think does the same thing. The consensus is yeah. that it's a, a, a failure. Yeah. But, um, um, the, I. Ah, oh, this ending. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk more about this. I think it, I think it's the idea that you know most films it's sort of like the conflict starts and then there's an acknowledgement of the fact mm. that the, there's been disruption in the narrative and then there's a resolution mm. and the film dies down again and this film just keeps going up yeah. and up and you up think she's going to escape in the, in the truck and then she doesn't and then the car looks like it's going to pass and it doesn't the film is at its peak excitement level yeah. in the final shot which is crazy mm. and yet her, her maniacal cackle is just <laughs> so glad to have finished the shoot <laughs> and here we have my favourite final shot of a movie and that Ever, yeah, ever at all time. Without question, it's it just, unbelievable. It just it it's... just represents the energy level of the film. Yeah. And <laughs> I... that's the motion that you do when you come out of seeing it. And the way it's the way it was done also as well. Like again, that's something that was uh, largely improvised by Gunnar Hansen. Yeah. Like he was, uh, I think Toby Hooper had like told him to be crazy with the chainsaw on a yeah. previous day, and then he did that kind of weird dance thing, and then Gun uh, he saw Toby Hooper duck, and yeah. he was saying like. Oh, that was quite fun. So he decided to just like yeah. go do this crazy dance, and the um, mania to it. Daniel Pearl as well, who did the cinematography, in order to get that, it, they had. It was almost like a 
improvised oh, dance yeah, routine yeah. 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 where he was like getting in and sort of coming out the right for time. the chainsaw yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's over already. I know, it's, it's, it's almost a shame. I'm sure we could say it say way more about it. I mean, is there much more that you want to talk about? We can go um, on for a bit. Oh, I guess one of the things I, one of the things I missed was um, uh, the, there was a shot initially of Edwin Neal, his, uh, his kind of corpse on the road. Oh, yeah, with the broken over. jaw, yeah. Yeah, and okay. apparently that was a horrible shot to take because it was, again, it was so hot. And the asphalt uh, started burning his skin. His didn't skin it? was yeah. burning uh, on the concrete, so everyone definitely physically suffered to make mm. this. And it shows, <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. God, even the credits are short. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody worked on it. It's like ten people worked on it, and unfortunately, they didn't get very well paid because so many yeah, people invested in the film. I don't know. It's it's a it's a weird one. There are mm. there are elements where I think like I think because we're so in awe of the film uh well i am um i am yeah. I, i've talked i've talked so much about uh like oh it's really wonderful um there, there is definitely i think it's almost like this film could only have been made when it was made yeah there's so yeah. much or it was dodgy made stuff to exactly it. the right time yeah and and like we said all the stuff about like marilyn burns and the other actors enduring great injury mm. it's just stuff that just wouldn't wouldn't it, it wouldn't fly now yeah. no way um or I mean, what I was thinking when I rewatched this today th was this the beginning of desensitization as we know it today? You know, because like you say, if you show this to some people today, I imagine it's almost like oh, there's no sort of you know, com like we say, there's to, in a gore sense, there's nothing here compared to what we see in films today, mm. and yet this was such a shock when it came out that was it the sort of watershed moment for horror the, that sort of moment when things just started to get more and more extreme this was like the line that was crossed for things to only get more that's that's such a hard uh, question to answer really I don't mean it on just a purely gore level but also just like I say in terms of like decent in terms of the terror you could convey yeah. on screen mm. um yeah, it's it's an odd one because like you know, Last House on the Left came out yeah. two years earlier. Oh, yeah. I mean that they, is... they took inspiration from that as well, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But like again, Last House on the Left is different because Last House on the Left is genuinely sort of grungy, and it, it's almost like it it feels very much like documentary footage of mm -hmm. actual violence. You see the blood and you see yeah. what's happening, and it's yeah. that film is really disturbing to watch. Mm. Uh, whereas this is uh, it's much more about suggestion mm. and like maintaining terror through yeah much more unconventional methods definitely one that you would teach to anyone looking to make a horror film yeah this is how you execute horror absolutely absolutely it is play with the audience's imaginations and fears primal fears mm. yeah I, I think it, it's important to explain because I, uh, I, was, I was talking uh, <laughs> I was texting my uh, uh, brother the other day and uh, he was saying, like, what are you doing tonight? And uh, I was like, <laughs> watching my favorite movie. <laughs> I was like, I'm watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And he replied, it's weird how much you watch that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I guess um, I, I explained a bit at the beginning why I th uh, this is one of my favorite films. But also, like, not to go too kind of deep with it, but on a more personal note, I think with this film, uh, the best way I can describe it is like, um, I do consider myself. Uh, in some ways like a bit of an anxious person like I worry a lot about things I worry about conflict I worry about mm. making sort of very small oh, yeah, mistakes I've, I've witnessed that <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm sure you have in like uh, the, you know things in the grand scheme of things that don't matter yeah. it's like oh no I left this behind it's the end of the world mm. um, I see it in your eyes sometimes <laughs> we'll be, well, no, we will be like walking along and like something will be going on on the other side of the street I can see you become like aware of it it's yeah, that sort of thing, isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it, it's well. Hopefully, that's an experience a lot of people. Have as well. <laughs> no, yeah, I have the same thing. Me. Yeah, I was talking with my sister about it the other day. Actually, we, we both kind of have that. Yeah, it, it's just like a, it, and you know, those thoughts are essentially fear, aren't they? Like yeah. fear of what might happen, yeah. fear of what you might lose, um, mm. all, all kinds of things. For your safety, you fear for your safety. Yeah, and. Um, there was a there was there was a time I won't go into what it was for the sake of our listeners, but like there is there was a time where I was really sort of anxious about something, and it had been something that had been kind of worrying me for a while, and it came to a head on one particular day, and I I was really sort of feeling like 
you know, had a, had a low opinion of myself and was still feeling like very kind of like. This was a while back. Uh, it was a like, <laughs> not to go too. Oh deep. yeah, yeah. It was always like a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of walking home at the end of the day. And I was like, God, that was a really like a not a nice day. And I, you know, a lot of kind yeah. of still oh, uh, yeah. felt felt very light chested really still. Yeah, yeah. And then um, you know, so I was thinking like, oh God, what do I do? Like, do I kind of meet a friend or something? I really wanted <laughs> no, to wa- watch this. <laughs> I really wanted to watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I couldn't explain why. I was just like, I really want to watch this. So I I sat and watched it, and then I just the kind of the spell this film casts over you it sort of displays that anxiety with a very different kind of anxiety. A weird release for it and at the end i yeah i felt weirdly released by it and mm. i felt and um, yeah it was um i don't know i think maybe like saying it like kind of pacified it is probably too strong well, it but sort of engages your adrenaline in a different way kind yeah of spends that it's it, it drives you right to the edge so that once you wake up from this nightmare you're kind of refreshed and <laughs> absolutely you know, absolutely it was all just a dream <laughs> um and yeah it was a weirdly like sobering experience after mm. i watched it that time and i think that's when it really kind of cemented itself as one of my favorite films um because it, it, it suddenly felt like a more personal experience and it didn't feel yeah it didn't feel like exploitative and it didn't mm. feel like i was enjoying other people's suffering it felt like well, you're there with her yeah and yeah. i was putting myself through this mm. own experience kind of to feel something and to just access my emotions and access my senses more yeah. it's it's strange um but it's understandable yeah I, I, I find it a really really arresting experience i'm very glad you introduced me to it oh, well <laughs> thank you for letting me do this commentary <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome i'm sorry if that's triggered anyone this this film by all means, if this is the first time you've watched it with our commentary, um, may- maybe get a pillow or two to snuggle up to, <laughs> hide yourself before uh, behind. Um, you always you end these it. commentaries like a CBB's host. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure people are safe. So, so remember, remember everyone, to... snuggle up with some pillows. <laughs> <laughs> make sure Eagle Piggle is there by your side and watch the Texas uh, Chainsaw. No, watch us. this film and don't watch the remakes because they're. <laughs> Maybe silly. by would you even watch them as like point of comparison sort of thing? Like what did this do right? If you this... wanted to engage in like an academic exercise of sort of what works and psycho what doesn't, psycho by psycho. Yes, yes. yes. Um, then maybe, but I think just watch this original, and um, well, let, you know, let yourself be scared. I I haven't seen them yet, but I think by the sounds of things, the sequels are at least interesting because obviously they go for a comedy route with the second one. I think the third one they go very extreme and then the fourth one like I say is almost like a subversion of the first so it's clear that at least for four the, those four they had some sense to like you know go in different directions with it even if they weren't successful um, maybe a less successful version of like the Alien series where they're all kind of a similar film but with different styles to it yeah um, or I, I mean I, right. I'm less familiar with it but the Nightmare on Elm Street series some of the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels I really like. Yeah, I'm exactly. still trying to get you to watch. Freddy's yeah, yeah, Revenge, Freddy's Revenge. Yeah, everyone hates, but I think it's really good. <laughs> the hidden masterpiece. Um, yeah, I'd definitely be up for maybe a Texas Chainsaw Night <laughs> a marathon. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Watch um, every massacre unfold before us. Well, but, um, um, this will always be the first and the best. I agree. I concur completely. Uh, well. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you. And uh, sweet dreams tonight. Stay scared. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>